morning, Jeff. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Thanks for having me, Nick. How are you doing? Yeah, doing good, doing good. How are you? Thank I'm you. all right. Yes, yeah, a beautiful, bright, sunny day here. So, um, yeah, I'm in a good mood. I suppose my first question is, are we as businesses and people, are we getting smarter and safer? Or are we getting more comfortable and therefore more unaware? I think it's probably favouring towards the latter, uh, to be honest. There's been this massive shift. I mean, obviously, the working from home thing has taken over. Frankly, that was a trend that was happening anyway. It's just been accelerated massively by coronavirus. Um, in terms of that, I think a lot of businesses have been forced into quite an uncomfortable position. Suddenly, there's a big difference between, you know, a couple of people working from home every now and again, who have got childcare issues or whatever, and suddenly everybody in your entire company working from home. So a system that could have coped with, you know, 30, 40, 50 people has now got to cope with thousands of people in some cases, big industries. Um, that puts a huge amount of strain on stuff. I suspect what companies have done is cobbled things together a little bit, uh, made things work on the fly. I know a lot of tech teams have had to just make it work. They've been told, look, this system has to support thousands of people, make it work. Yeah. Security often takes a backseat because it's like, look, we just need to keep the business running. We'll deal with security later. So I think some of the security problems and security holes are going to start coming out now because, you know, the cobbling together process starts to expose its weaknesses after a certain amount of time. So that's, that's I think, where we are roughly. And do you think, do you think the, the criminals or the people who are exploiting this, are they getting smarter or are they just kind of taking advantage of the opportunity? There's been this really interesting picture. I mean, when, when coronavirus first happened, I got people approaching me saying, oh, cybercrime must be going off the hook. There must be loads of cybercrime because there was massive amounts of fraud and phishing emails and cyber attacks mm. based around coronavirus. There's a huge uptick in coronavirus spam, for example. But that's because we didn't have coronavirus spam before. Of course, there's massively more coronavirus spam now than ever was before because we never had coronavirus in the headlines before. What's been really interesting is if you look at the overall levels of cybercrime, this is according to the UK's National Cybersecurity Centre, there's not been a massive uptick in overall levels of cybercrime. All that's happened is they would normally hit you with, I don't know, HMRC spam or Viagra spam, and they've now just switched to hitting you with coronavirus spam. So those cybercrime gangs haven't necessarily massively scaled up, but they are getting smarter and they are starting to capitalise more quickly on headlines. So as soon as the vaccines came out, you started seeing loads of coronavirus spam coming out around vaccines. As soon as companies started switching to working from home, there was loads of work in the underground, the criminal underground, around uh, remote connections of VPNs and all that kind of stuff you have to use to make your working from home environment work. So, yes, the criminals are getting smarter at this and it is something to watch out for. But mm. I want to just temper that by saying, look, we're not in the middle of a, of a cybercrime epidemic in the way that we are in the middle of a coronavirus epidemic, thankfully. So, OK, so tell me... Is AI stepped up it's kind of in this? Is the AI helping the criminals more and are they using it to their advantage? Do you know, again, there's a sort of realistic kind of approach, uh, answer to that, which is um, the criminals are really interested in, in artificial intelligence mm. that are being used by defenders. So criminals are really interested in all the security companies, what AI they're using, how companies are using AI to protect themselves, because the criminals want to get around it. That's their interest in AI. To a certain extent, Cyber criminals are starting to use what you might call artificial intelligence. So they are automating attacks. So a pretty basic example. Ransomware is one of the big sort of cash cows for cybercrime at the moment. They hit your files, they scramble your files, charge your ransom to get them unscrambled. Yeah. Very basic form of cybercrime. Now what the criminals will do is use a sort of automated scanner to work out how big your business is. So if you've got 5,000 PCs, you're running 5,000 computers, you're a pretty big business. So the ransom goes up. So you could look at that and say, well, that's a sort of version of AI. It's a slightly automated tool. So at the sort of lower end, cyber criminals are getting smarter at using AI type tools to sift out their victims. But in terms of, you know, cyber criminals using supercomputers to break passwords, it's not happening. And it's not happening because, frankly, they've got enough money they can make from the low hanging fruit. <laughs> you know, they don't need a supercomputer to break passwords because often people have just used the same password that they've used before or they're using the password password. So that's, I'm not sure that's reassuring or almost <laughs> slightly scary, but yeah, but you can, I mean, you know, by simply making your passwords a bit more secure, you can raise yourself up against that uh, above that low hanging fruit. So, uh, so that's the picture. You, I, think. I mean, because I, I was, I've been reading quite a bit about passwords and how kind of we all just use our basic password and our, and our pets' names, etc. Et Do you have what's your thoughts around the psychology around passwords and how, how we should be thinking about it and what's going to inspire us to actually? 
change our passwords. Now I'm revealing too much to you about how simplistic my passwords are. <laughs> yeah, um, it's interesting. I mean, we can play a sort of fun game about that. So I'm going to try, I won't guess your password, but I'll try and guess some things about your password if you want. Um, I'm guessing that your password uh, is has got a word in it, like a word that I would find in a dictionary or proper name or something like that. Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing that the first letter is a capital letter. Is that right? Oh, no, 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 it's not. It, oh, it's okay. one of the first few, but it's not the first one. Okie dokie. And does it end with a number, your password? Yeah. And is the number four digits or two digits usually? Yes. And if it's four digits, usually the first digits are one and nine, because it's 90 or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah. so basically, so people use patterns to set passwords and it's yeah. fine, you know, we, they make them easier to remember, but they do make them easier to crack. So if you're using that formula where it's like, word you will find in the dictionary starts with a capital letter, ends with my date, my year of birth, that's not a particularly great password. You can make it loads safer by simply swapping and putting the date at the beginning, put numbers at the beginning, yeah. Very few people do that and it makes it loads, loads more secure. So it's just a simple thing you can do. Key thing as well, use different passwords for every service. I tweak the password. So I have the same basic thing and I tweak it for different services. Uh, you can get more secure than that. You should have a strong and independent one for every service that you use. But, you know, there's a level, isn't there, between remembering <laughs> the passwords. Okay, so turning back to business, kind of in turning back to what you said in terms of um, over the last year, kind of we've cobbled together stuff in order to work remotely as a society. If there's one question that, or two questions that businesses need to start asking themselves to check that they are safe and um, secure, what, where, where should they start? I think question number one is, imagine that the situation you have today with your security, your, your IT security, imagine that becomes permanent, that's forever. Because as you, as you cobble something together, it starts to become permanent. You know, people find ways of working around things. They find ways of making something work. And then over time, they concretize. And so people get used to it and they start to think, well, that's, that's the way we do it. The, the snapshot picture of your business's IT security today, if that became permanent, would that be OK? So, for example, it's companies have got uh, remote desktop things where you, you log in from home and what you're seeing on your laptop screen at home is actually your work computer. So when you move the mouse, the mouse is actually moving on your computer at work. And it's, it's a workaround, it's a good workaround, but for, for employees, it's painful because there's a delay from when they move the mouse at home to when the mouse moves on the work computer. They hate it. That should not become permanent. You don't want that to be a permanent situation. Same with IT security, you know, the, the workarounds and the patches you put in place, if they became permanent, would you still be safe? If not, you need to start changing things. So that's question one, you know, what if today's situation became permanent? Question number two is, the pendulum is going to swing back. Um, there's this great, I always tell a story about um, the Great Fire of London. Great Fire of London destroyed, I think, four fifths of London's buildings, absolute mm -hmm. chaos. Didn't thankfully kill that many people as far as we're aware, but there was this idea afterwards we would rebuild London, we would build back better. And Sir Christopher Wren came out with this amazing design of the city of London that he would put together beautiful European modern streets and this spoken hub system. It's, it's a wonderful picture that he, that he drew. And you go back to the city of London today, it looks nothing like it. Because of course, Londoners built back the same, the exact mm -hmm. same. Pudding Lane, Bread Lane, Bread Street, they're all on the same, exact same street plan. Do not underestimate people's ability to get back exactly what they had before. So I think the pendulum, you know, obviously coronavirus, the pendulum swung massively to one way. It is going to swing back. There is going to be a sort of let's put things back how they were. It might not get all the way back. And so where it lands in the middle is going to be an interesting question. But for businesses, you are just approaching a hybrid future, certainly for the next, let's say, three to five years. Some of what we've experienced in coronavirus is going to stay with you. There's going to be an expectation for employees that will stay there. But some employees will say, no, I want to be back at my desk in the office. That's where I want to be. So, again, you need to sort of brace yourself now for the pendulum swinging back and to run almost two systems, two IT security systems, one for home, one for work, one for working remotely, one for people who are actually in the office. And, and to make those both as secure, but also mm. both as good and convenient for employees. If the guys working from home have a worse experience than the ones in the office, that's going to affect things, going to affect how things work. So those, I think, are the two, the two main things. From your perspective, how, how do you think the balance is between the leadership of the business and business itself, employees in terms of whose responsibility it is around yeah. kind of the security of the company? There's this great quote from Spider-Man, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And, you know, in the workplace, we have now got so much more power than we ever had before. We can access documents we would never have been able to access before. Immediately, remotely, it's all fine. But with that comes great responsibility, you know, because we have so much power as individual employees. The lowest level worker in a, in a company will often have access to the shared 
computer drive with all of the confidential, a lot of the confidential stuff on it. Now for hackers, they think, well, okay, I could try and hack the CEO or I could just go for the guy who's, you know, their work experience doesn't give a damn about the company. So, you know, with this great responsibility that we've got, we've also, with this great power that we've got to access company resources, there's great responsibility on everybody, not just the really senior people, but everybody to take security seriously. That's just been a picture generally. Mm. With working from home, I think that's accelerated because your employees have now got direct access from their home environment into the company, into the organization. Now, as a hacker, you've suddenly got a whole bigger, what they call attack surface. Because yeah, you can attack the employee, but hey, you could also try and attack their kids, their partner, their router, their smart fridge, their smart telly. Mm. Suddenly your, your ability to get into a company is massively upscaled. There's a big win here, there's a big advantage that I think companies need to focus on. Because your workers are working from home, their home IT is now your work IT. You know, mm. my home router, my home kit, my home laptop is now an extension of my company's IT. Now, on one hand, that's terrifying because, as I say, hackers can now target people at home as well as at work. The company has to work out what its obligations are to its employees, how it can make sure they're secure at home. But employees want better security at home. You know, we all want our family, our home, you know, our kids to be secure. And so now companies and employees can work together. And it's a big win for companies because they say, look, you know, it's not about just IT security for work anymore. It's your home security. It's your actual personal security for you and your family. And employees take notice of that. They sit up and they switch on when they realize they're getting sort of home security lessons for free. So I think there's a big win here potentially among the sort of chaos of the fact that companies are having to work out where their, where their liability ends, how far into the home their tentacles reach. In the world that you live in, whenever, whenever we see each other and we're chatting, always you tell me some amazing stories. So I suppose to sign off, tell me something you've learned recently that's going to surprise, that surprise, that will surprise us all. <laughs> There's a great story I've been working on, actually, about a bunch of hackers who broke into a bank in India. And, um, uh, you know, the banks are full of money. You've got to get the money out somehow. But the problem is... If you take money from a bank and you withdraw it through the usual systems, there's always a paper trail, right? There's always a sort of breadcrumb trail because computers remember everything. So often the way hackers get caught is they transfer money out of the bank, but they transfer it to a particular bank account and the investigators trace the money and they get it back. So, you know, so these hackers figured out, a, a, I say a great way, obviously not great for the bank, but in a remarkably innovative way, they realized they had access to the ATM software in the bank. So when you put your card in a cash point anywhere around the world, the cash point like dials back to your bank that you have your account with to the ATM software and says, oh, Jeff's put his card in a cash point in Montreal. Can we give him some money, please? So the hackers realized they had access to this software. So they thought, well, hmm, that means we can approve transactions anywhere around the world, everywhere. So they managed to do 12,000 transactions in 29 different countries in, and they withdrew $11 million dollars in under two hours from cash points around the world. I mean, this was like, this is, there's a name for this in hacking circles. It's called jackpotting when the cash point just spews out cash. Now the advantage for the hackers is cash is cash. You can't trace it. It's then in the pockets of individuals around the world. So you've got 11 million dollars that you've stolen that the bank really can't trace because it's just in cash. It could have gone anywhere. The downside, the hazard for the hackers is you've now got dudes in 29 different countries running around with pockets full of cash. How do you get the money back? How do you pull in that cash that you've stolen? And that's sort of the next chapter that I'm working on in terms of my research. So it's just, it's an astonishing story. I love that. So kind of, they've done the deed, but actually they've suddenly realized that the power is all these individuals <laughs> who are just having the time of their lives. How do we get the money back? Yeah. Jeff, as always, thank you so much for your time. It's been lovely speaking to you. Great to speak to you. Thanks, Nick.